So thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. What I want to do is spend a little bit of time talking about machine learning and what the ethical implications are to come out of it, because you've probably heard these days in the news a bunch of stuff about machine learning. If you don't already know it, it's, it's impacted your life for years. It will continue to impact your life even more, and in some ways that have even greater ethical implications than people have talked about. So to sort of start with, let me just give you the quick outline, right, because as an academic, I've got to give you the outline. Um, so let's talk about what is machine learning, just to level set a little bit to make sure everyone knows what we're kind of talking about, and some of the promises and perils. There's positives as well as negatives. Then we'll talk a little bit about fairness and the notion of how that comes up in machine learning and the broader notion of what does it even mean to be fair. And then we can do a particular uh, deep dive on one particular algorithm that's actually been used for many years and talk about its fairness implications and algorithm called Compass. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about data privacy and wrap up with some final thoughts. So what is machine learning? Some of you here might be intimately familiar, there are actually some familiar faces who are machine learning researchers, but just at a high level, um, machine learning is about finding useful patterns in data, and that can take lots of different forms. And so just to give you a short list of some of the things that's been used for very successfully for many years, stock price prediction, for example, there's lots of big firms on Wall Street that actually trade billions of dollars a year based on machine learning models. Uh, computational biology and medical diagnosis, there are some uh, references to that earlier, but the notion of, for example, can we determine the likelihood that someone may have cancer based on clinical or demographic data about them. One of the most common ones that exists on the internet, people are likely to purchase a product or click on an ad, Right, so the Facebooks and Googles and the Amazons of the world are all heavily invested in machine learning, have been for many years to try to optimize uh, ad placement, for example. Criminal justice is an area many people may not know about, but actually algorithms exist. As a matter of fact, in California, we just passed a bill, SB 10, that got rid of the cash bail system to replace it with algorithms. And that's one of the things we'll take a little bit of a deep dive on. But basically, given a person's criminal history, can we determine if they should be granted bail or not based on a machine learning system? And in case you didn't know, for many years, your email has been filtered for spam using machine learning. Okay? So it's impacted your life in many ways, whether or not you knew about it or not. So what is machine learning? So it takes many different forms. I'm just going to focus on one particular task here, one subset of machine learning, which is the prediction task, sometimes known as classification. And so I've got to get a little bit mathy on you, right? And if you don't worry about the math, that's perfectly fine. But for some of you who are like, give me a little bit more detail, because I want to understand when I see that billboard on 101 that says machine learning, what they're talking about. And the idea is we want to make a prediction based on observation. So what does that mean? It means we get to see some set of observed variables. Okay? And those variables can be things like someone, say, their age, their income, their level of education, etc. There's a bunch of variables that we can measure for each person or each entity we want to make predictions about. Those are called their input features or input variables, and I just gave you some examples of them. And for short, for the being a mathematical type, you make a bold faced X because it's really a vector, but that's totally unimportant. Okay? Given some sort of information, there is a variable why we want to predict. That's the thing we want to predict. So for example, based on someone's age, annual income, gender, their education, they committed a crime, we want to predict whether or not they're likely to commit another crime. Should they be granted bail or not? So whether or not this thing is the output Y is called the output variable or feature, that's the thing we want to predict. It actually happens to you every time you swipe your credit card. We can predict whether or not you should be issued credit in some sense should that transaction be approved or not. And when you get a phone call from your credit card company, if you've ever had this happen, that says there's these charges that look suspicious, why do they look suspicious? Because they're out of band for what the model says you should be spending your money on. Okay? So really, this whole machine learning thing, as sexy as it sounds, people talk about deep learning and machine learning and AI and all of it, it's learning a little function. And when you tell someone it's learning a little function, that doesn't sound so sexy, and your grants are much smaller if you're an academic. The amount of venture capital investment you get is much smaller. So we do AI. Okay? But really, all that is is we're seeking to learn, which is some form of function optimization, some function d of x that basically says, you give me the set of inputs for someone, write the x, those are the things we can observe about them, I will give you a prediction for what that value y should be. Should they be granted credit? Should they be given bail? Which ad should they actually be shown? Okay? That's the whole game. So what does the process look like? We get a bunch of data. It's called training data. What that training data is is historical data that shows us the relationships between the observables and what the output should have been. So for example, this might be, here's a bunch of demographic attributes for someone. 
did they actually commit a crime again or not, which is known as recidivating. Or here's a bunch of attributes of a particular credit card transaction. Was that a credit worthy transaction or not? Did it get paid back? Okay? So we have that for some historical data, a whole bunch of it. That's what we're going to use to train our model in some sense, which is the optimization. I added a bunch of things here about superscripts and subscripts, which are totally unimportant. Okay? But we have a bunch of data. That data goes into the learning algorithm, and the job of this learning algorithm is to determine what that function dx is. And once it produces that function, some new person comes along. We gather all their attributes x and stick it into that function, <laughs> and it gives us a prediction for that new piece of data. So really what we care about when we are building these models in machine learning is how well we do on predicting for new data something that we care about predicting. Okay? So that's the name of the game. So this has promises and perils. What are some of each of them if we look at them? Okay? So the promises are, gives us insight about the domain. It helps us understand for the inputs how are they related to the output. For example, in criminal recidivism, what are the sorts of things that make it likely that someone might commit a crime again? And it potentially also eliminates bias and inconsistency, because who grants bail now? Judges. Turns out judges are human beings, and human beings are extremely biased instruments. Okay? Turns out if you look at the time series of the, whether or not judges grant bail or the sentences they give to individuals, they tend to give more lenient sentences after breakfast and after lunch, after they eat. <laughs> and later in the afternoon, when they're getting grumpy and hungry and they want to go home, they give longer sentences. This is well documented. This is our criminal justice system, right? So someone comes along and says, let's do some machine learning because the algorithm doesn't get tired. It'll do a better job. It's more efficient than human beings. It's less error prone. It's more consistent. OK, that sounds good. Let's go do that. Well, what are the cons? What are the perils? Remember, this thing is trained on historical data. So what does that historical data reflect? All the existing biases and grumpiness of human beings. Okay? So it has a potential, to, despite the fact that we might think that it's this objective system, really what it's doing is potentially encoding our existing biases into that system and giving us a false sense of security that it's objective. Okay? It also lacks transparency and threatens due process. Right? So I get denied bail by an algorithm, and I ask why. And the answer is because the algorithm said so. <laughs> Where's my due process? Right? Increased efficiency is not always a benefit. And for as a computer scientist saying that, when I tell that to my computer science friends, they wig out, because that's how we measure how good our algorithms are, how efficient they are. So why might we have increased efficiency not always be a benefit? Let me give you a simple example of something we could do today if we wanted to. We could take your car and outfit it with a system that it detects the speed limit any time you're driving, and any time you drive over the speed limit in any given zone, it issues you a ticket. <laughs> measures how many tickets you have, and when you get enough that are unpaid, it immediately issues a warrant for your arrest. <laughs> That's efficiency. That's not necessarily a society we want to live in. So we need to balance the notions of efficiently executing particular things that we believe are good with what we really believe the implications are of that additional efficiency. Okay? And then there's also this privacy issue, right? Where does the data come from? What does it reflect? We'll talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about fairness in these algorithms. That we've sort of created these tensions for you. Okay? So what is fair? This is kind of this philosophical question. It turns out the last year I had the pleasure of working with two folks in the political science department, one of whom is Rob Reese, who's a moral philosopher. We would sit and talk about things like fairness. Okay? And there's many different notions of fairness. As a matter of fact, uh, Narayan, who is a computer scientist in 2018, provided 21 different notions of fairness. They're all at some level intuitively appealing, but inconsistent. Okay? And so let me tell you some of the most common ones, just so we have we can level set. And to understand that, we need to understand some legal concepts. I also had the benefit of working with someone else, Jeremy Weinstein, also in our political science department, who's a public policy expert and worked for a while in the Obama administration. Okay? So it turns out, if we're looking at these characteristics of data, there are some of these characteristics that legally cannot be used to discriminate individuals in a decision-making circumstance for a particular kind of decision. So let me give you an example. In employment decisions, there's these protected characteristics that include race, gender, and age, among others. You cannot discriminate among, among applicants based on their age, for example. That's illegal. So that's a legal concept. Okay? In medicine, however, it might make sense to actually prescribe different treatments to different genders or to different age categories, right? So there it's not illegal to use those protected characteristics. So it depends on context. That's the important thing to remember. And 
Even more importantly, there's this notion of disparate impact. And the idea of disparate impact is the impact of a policy if it's different between two groups, okay, based on a protected characteristic. That's illegal even if there isn't discriminatory intent. I didn't intend to discriminate, but it turns out what I did tended to favor a particular gender over another gender. It impacted them differently, and as a result, that would be illegal. Okay? So how does this relate to this notion of fairness to try to put in some concrete definition or some particular terms? Okay? There's a notion of anti-classification. Anti-classification says you make your decision where you don't use any of the correct uh, protected characteristics. If you're sort of you know, a mathematical type, that means we'll say XP is the set of protected characteristics. And the decision we would make for two different individuals if we ignored their protected characteristics and otherwise those two individuals look the same should be the same decision. That's anti-classification. Okay. Then there's classification parity. What classification parity says is that your error across the groups, when you make an error, right, you say someone should have been denied bail, but they really should have been granted bail, that error is equivalent across groups defined by protected characteristics. Okay. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean you never make errors. It may, means the number of errors you make for black people versus white people should be the same. Okay. So that's the notion of classification parity. Then there's a notion of calibration, right? I mean, and classification seems reasonable. There are these protected characteristics. Classification parity, their error rates should be equivalent across different groups, seems real reasonable. Then there's this notion of calibration. Calibration says the outcome should be independent of protected characteristics conditioned on a risk. What does that mean? It means if we look at two different people who are, say, in the criminal justice system, we can predict a risk for each one of them as to whether or not they are likely to commit a crime again. Okay? And what calibration says is it shouldn't matter for two people with the same risk score whether or not white is one, white or black. If they have the same risk score, they should be treated equally. That seems reasonable. Okay. And then there's another notion, which is disparate impact, which we talked about before. So you can think of a notion of fairness as a policy that lacks disparate impact. It doesn't actually have disparate impact. You're like, okay, there's four out of the 21. Those all seem reasonable. That's great. Why don't I just optimize for all four of these? And then the computer scientists come along. Okay? And I seem to have lost the slide here. Somehow, one of my slides went away. Well, we'll come back. Let's consider a particular algorithm, and we'll actually look at how fairness comes up in this particular algorithm. Okay, so there's a particular algorithm called Compass. It's actually a modeling algorithm by North Point. It's a company that assesses risk of recidivism, the chance that someone will recommit a crime. And it's used basically to determine if someone should be granted bail or not. Okay? Race is not one of the inputs to the module, to the learning algorithm, right? The race is a protected characteristic with respect to bail, so it's not actually an input. We don't know the person's race. But we could look at how much, how much of the time does it make a mistake, right? And so if you're a stats type, there's this dreaded thing called the contingency table that you probably remember at some point from statistics way back in the day. Try to block it out, but it's okay. It keeps coming back. <laughs> and part of the idea is when we say someone is high risk or low risk for committing another crime, did they actually commit another crime or not if we look at historical data? So did they risk... They recidivated, which is hard to say three times fast. That means they committed a crime again, or they did not recidivate, right? So if we say they were high risk and they would have recidivated, that's a true example. And if we say they're low risk and they did not recidivate, that is a true negative. But if we flip them around and we say they're high risk but they would not recidivate, that's a false positive. We would have said they were a positive example, but that was false. They wouldn't actually commit the crime again. So ProPublica, which is actually a journalistic organization, did an analysis and showed that there's not actually classification parity if you look at the way errors were made. So interestingly enough, on average, this algorithm is 61% correct, which seems reasonable until you think that it's a 50-50 decision, so 61% really isn't that good. Okay. But it correctly classified white defendants 59% of the time and black defendants 63% of the time. So you would say, well, that's interesting. It's actually more accurate for the black defendants than the white defendants. Until you dig a little bit deeper into notions of fairness, and what you find is the way the misclassifications happen are different. Okay? For blacks who did not recidivate, 45% were labeled high risk, versus for whites who did not recidivate, only 23% were labeled high risk. So if you were unlikely to recidivate, you are twice as likely if you were black to actually be deemed high risk and potentially denied bail. Okay? What happened on the flip side? 
of the blacks who recidivated, they were labeled low risk 28% of the time, versus the whites who recidivated were labeled low risk 48% of the time. Okay? And race is not an input to this algorithm. This is just what it learned based on historical data. Okay? So then we think about, okay, so what does this mean for us? What is, you know, North Point's answer when you take this data to them and you say, you know what, yeah, there's this problem. They say, oh, no, no, no. We calibrated our algorithm. If you look at the risk scores that are generated by our algorithm versus the probabilities that someone actually recidivated, and you look at it for whites and blacks, they are within one standard deviation of each other through the whole spectrum. This algorithm is calibrated. And you say, but there was that classification parity that we weren't meeting before. But you say it's calibrated. How does that happen? Then the computer scientists come along and say, hey, you know what, let's just take all the definitions and optimize them all at once. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, it would be great, except it's mathematically impossible. Okay? So John Kleinberg and friends, Kleinberg's actually a theoretical computer scientist at Cornell, actually proves that you can't simultaneously satisfy all these definitions. Specifically, they look at calibration and classification accuracy, which are two of the ones that we looked at, or classification parity, that seem eminently reasonable in and of themselves. They're just not simultaneously optimizable. Okay? So you can also have proxies for protected characteristics. So what do I mean by that? It means you can have a feature that strongly correlates with something. Your zip code strongly correlates with your race. Zip code is not a protected characteristic, but race is. But I can include your zip code in a model and still make predictions, and that's legal. I can also look at disproportionality in data. So what do we mean by disproportionality in data? So if, let's say, I'm trying to predict something that's super rare, right? I'm trying to build a classifier to predict a condition that only happens in half a percent of the population. I can actually have a classifier that's 99.5% correct by predicting no one has the condition. That's a useless classifier. These are the percentages for HIV in the United States. Okay? So we need to think about what the problems really are before we just turn up the crank and say, hey, it's 99.5% accurate if we don't understand the nuances of the problem. And then there's also issues where the risk distributions differ. What do I mean by that? So what's actually going on with the compass algorithm? What's actually going on, this is some analysis that was done uh, by uh, Corbett Davies and Sharad Goel, who are actually at, well, Corbett Davies is graduated now, Sharad's a professor there, where they looked at what actually are the distribution of risk scores, right? And they looked at people who, whether or not they were put low or medium high is kind of one category for risk for black people versus white people. And it turned out, actually, that black defendants' recidivism rate is higher than whites in the historical data that's used to train the algorithm. And so the proportion of black defendants who are deemed a medium or high risk is actually higher because of the historical data, because there wasn't an attempt to try to do some sort of calibration in the data before it went into the model. And so as a result, you get sort of this difference in classification parity. Now, you could actually adjust the model to account for that, to actually have equal numbers in terms of parity, have those percentages be correct. But if you do that, it requires you to have different risk thresholds for white people and black people. So then it becomes a societal question, is that something you want to do? And that's kind of the bigger question we get into with machine learning. So let's talk a little bit about data privacy as well. Where does the data come from? Just so if you're not disturbed already, I can disturb you a little bit more. It's a Thursday night. Why not get disturbed? <laughs> so what is privacy? Right? That's actually one of these questions. People like to throw around this term privacy all the time without necessarily defining what it means. And privacy is actually an extremely ill-defined concept. Okay? But if we think about privacy in both the public and private sphere, one way to think about privacy is it's central to individual autonomy or self-determination. What I mean by that, the claim of individuals to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is shared or communicated <coughs> with others. If you believe that every word you were saying at every moment in your life was being recorded and publicly available to other people, you would probably act differently. Which means that having privacy changes your ability to have autonomy and your self-determination. Okay? So violations of privacy impose harms, right? It's actually a loss of freedom and a loss of intimacy if we lose privacy. It's not just some sort of esoteric concern. So what does that mean in terms of, you know, if we think about data privacy? It has a balance of competing interests here. 
right? There are some places where we really want to make data available for meaningful analysis because it would be great. We want to be able to audit algorithms for decision making, so we need to see the data. Medical research and healthcare improvement, which we just saw some talks on, we need data. It would be great to have that. That argues for making the data as widely available as possible. But what about protecting individual privacy? Right. If you think about the personal values of privacy and respect for the individual, the notion that we have freedom of speech, that we want to be able to keep private, avoiding discrimination, and that's why we get all these regulations. So pick your favorite, because three letters is really too short when it comes to privacy. So you need to have a four or five letter acronym, and there's all kinds of ones for um, you know, health information, your academic information, GDPR in Europe, which acts as a very different view of privacy from the United States, and then preventing access from adversaries. But let's make this more concrete. Let's say I'm a row in some database somewhere, right? So there I am. I'm not going to really publish my social security number. But a bunch of attributes about me, and I just made up this other person. Okay? And you can say, oh, well, that's interesting. If we want to use this data, why don't we anonymize it? So we'll get rid of name and social security number. We're like, okay, that seems reasonable. Okay, well, but there you also told me like gender is a protected characteristic and age is a protected characteristic, right? So why don't we also get rid of gender and the year for date of birth? That sounds good too, all right? So we drop those. And then I say, okay, so how well is this data anonymized? Right? So let me take this row that was me, just that data, right? Whether it's indicative of whether or not I have some condition or not. And I put that into Google. <laughs> I'm number one. <laughs> right? Not something I'm proud of. It's super easy. In many cases, you're one query away from de anonymizing someone. Now, you might say, okay, but Marilyn, you have a Wikipedia page. You must be important. No, I don't have a Wikipedia page. It doesn't make you important. What really happens to real people, okay? So, a few years back, Massachusetts Group's Insurance Commission says we're going to release anonymized data of split state employee hospital visits, 135,000 medical records, okay? And William Weld, who was the governor at the time, assured the public that this is private. It's been anonymized. You're safe. Enter Latanya Sweeney, who at the time was a graduate student at MIT. Now she's a professor at Harvard. You'll see why. Okay. She knew Weld lived in Cambridge. So what did she do? For $20, she bought the Cambridge voter list, which is public information. You just have to pay for it to be compiled for you. Containing name, address, including someone's zip code, birth date, gender, and will live 54,000 voters in the city. She then joined that data with the GIC data that's supposed to be anonymized, re-identifying Weld. How does she re-identify Weld? Because there's only six people in Cambridge who shares Weld's birthday. Only three of those six were men, and only one lived in a zip code, so it's uniquely identified in the data. And to make a point, this is the part of the story I love, she mails him his medical <laughs> Just to show that things we think are anonymous really aren't. Okay. And then she follows up with a paper to show that this isn't magic or you know some sort of voodoo. Just think combinatorially. And what she figures out is 87% of all Americans can be uniquely identified using just their zip code, birth date, and sex. If you just run the numbers, it's actually not surprising, right? There's about 42,000 zip codes in the United States. There's about 365 birth dates per year. If you were born on a leap day, I apologize, we're not counting you. For about 80 years, most individuals identify as one of two sexes. We'll just use two for now. You multiply those numbers, you get 2.5 billion. The U.S. population is only about 330 million, which means most people end up in a cell by themselves. 87% of people do. And as a matter of fact, there's a website where you can see if this applies to you. So you go ahead and you type in your zip code, your gender, and your birthday, and it turns out I'm actually uniquely identified by those three things. You probably are too. Okay, so you can try it out. And if you imagine many things, forms that you fill out that are anonymous, that asked you, well, we need to have your zip code to know like which demographic area you're in. We need your birthday because we need to figure out whether or not, um, you know, which age group you fall into, and we want to know your gender so we can mark it appropriately to you. 87% of the time, they know who you are if they want to find out. Okay. So how does this all kind of translate into what happens to real people? So there's the story of a girl who Target determined was pregnant based on her purchase history and sent a marketing information to her house about information for baby products. Her father sees this and goes to Target very angrily wondering why Target is actually giving this information about baby products to her teenage daughter, to his teenage daughter. Because then it turns out his teenage daughter told him 
after that that she was pregnant. Targeted figured it out first. <laughs> and, and here's the thing that, you know, based on products that were purchased, here's the thing most people think, wow, that, that really freaks me out. What freaks me out even more is Target knows that that woman is pregnant, that she's going to have a baby. Assuming she has a baby, it will know when that baby is ready for getting out of diapers, when it's ready to go to school, when it's ready to go to middle school, to college, or what it's doing for the rest of its life, because it can track a whole age cycle. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's not just about predicting the birth. When you predict the birth, you have a new data point for a human being that you can track your time. So a few final thoughts. Now hopefully that you're sufficiently disturbed about all this. <laughs> Machine learning is being increasingly used for decision making in a number of contexts. I say this as someone who is a researcher in machine learning. Okay? And the important thing is not just to disturb you. The reason why I sort of pull all this stuff out to disturb you is not just to make you feel bad and hang your head and go home, but is to get you to think about what is the data you're providing, how is it used, and to hopefully motivate you to think about taking action with respect to how algorithms are actually used. Right? It's not just a technical question. And so the philosophical questions are what are the societal outcomes we actually want to achieve? Right? When we think about what is fairness, what do we really want that to be? When we think about our notions of privacy, what do we really value? And then there's political questions of how do we achieve those outcomes? That's the process where we all come together and we vote and we try to have policy. It's messy. It can be problematic. People yell and scream. But it's the best way we have now to actually address some of these issues. Okay? And there's part of the reason why I mention this is having this privilege of teaching this new class at Stanford with two folks, Rob Reich, who's a political philosopher, and Jeremy Weinstein, who's a public policy expert, and I'm the token technology guy, where we talk about all these issues through these different lenses. What's the technology? What's the outcome we want? How do we try to get society to achieve it? Okay? And really the bottom line is everyone has a role and responsibility with regard to this new technology because it will impact your life. It already has. So thanks very much for your attention.